So I started thinking about this sermon on Monday morning. Monday, which seems about, I don't know, 30 years ago, before the restart of the Cold War, which is not so cold right now. I thought on Monday that I would talk about the Jews of Ukraine, past, present, and future. And in particular, I was planning to frame my drosh this morning around President Zelensky. But to be honest, I wasn't sure he would be alive by Shabbos, this Shabbos, when I intended to give this talk. And I thank God that he is, that he is the courageous leader defending his country, uniting democracy and democratic nations, and that he does so unapologetically and proudly as a Jew. There is something Maccabean in this man, in his resolve, his chutzpahdik, and at the same time there is something tremendously sobering. So let me say this plainly and at the start. This conflict is not about the Jewish people. This is not about anti-Semitism. Though it is hard for many Jews, especially those who know a bit about the history of violence, towards Jews in that region to not see it through that frame of anti-Semitism. Putin, Yamach Shamo, may his name be blotted out, framed it that way. In a crazy perversion of anti-Jewish racism, he justified his invasion on the grounds that he needed to pursue a denazification of Ukraine. With its Jewish president, Ukraine also has a Jewish prime minister, by the way. It's just absurd. The former president of Russia, Medvedev, was less nuanced. He referred to Zelensky as a man with certain ethnic roots. It's a direct quote. And then suggested that he concealed, Zelensky did, his Jewish identity to serve the interests of the Ukrainian nationalists. Medvedev said that Zelensky's betrayal of Russia, that's also a direct quote, made him like a Sonder Commando. The Sonder Commandos, as we know, were the Jews who were forced to clean the ashes of the bodies of those that were murdered in the Shoah. When you use that kind of rhetoric about someone, I don't have to tell you that what you are doing is appealing to deeply ingrained anti-Semitic stereotypes in Russia and in Ukraine, and that you're doing so to undermine the credibility of the president who is, as he has said himself, the number one target of the Russian troops, and you are doing so to evoke deep-seated hatred for Jews that might turn Ukrainians against their elected leaders, a perceived cabal of Jewish masters, and it's something right out of the protocols of the elders of Zion, which comes right out of Russia as well. And I bring this up because if you don't understand why Putin and Medvedev are in part justifying this invasion by using anti-Semitic tropes, then we don't understand the long history that Ukraine has with the Jewish people, and understanding that history is crucial to understanding the situation today. Now, I want to be very clear before I continue. This war is about Ukraine and it's about Russia. It is not about the Jews. And at the same time, as Jews, we must acknowledge that our people have a deep historical connection to that place, a place that many, my family included, can trace our roots to, whether it is in our distant past or our not so distant past. My great-grandfather Pinchas, Allah v'shalom, was from Odessa. Was it Russia? Was it Ukraine? Was it Poland? We're actually not so sure. It's that fifth question at every Seder. Why do we know the city that Papa was from but not the country? And then the answer at the Seder. Because the borders kept changing. This war is about changing them again. There is that old Jewish line about looking out the window of your shtetl window to see which flag is flying in the town, the village square. And then you knew what country you were in, at least until they changed the flag again. 
And as Jews, however, living in the Ukraine, no matter whose flag it was, it wasn't ours. Historically, historically, Ukraine has not been a safe place to be a Jew. And I don't only mean the 20th century, but I mean in the history of the Jews of Ukraine going back more than 400 years. In the 16th and 17th century, Jews began to move into what was then Polish, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Remember, the flags keep changing. You had to look out your window. The numbers, our numbers, increased. And for Jews living in the late Middle Ages, they were doing pretty well there. And then in 1648, Bogdan Kilmanitsky, who was a military hero, helped foment a revolt and war began, 1648. And in 1648 and 49, there were what was known, what is known in Jewish history as Gezerot Takvatat, the evil decrees of 1648 and 1649. I'm looking at Chris Friedrichs to make sure, as our history professor, that I'm getting this right. In that time, thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of Jews were slaughtered a third of the entire Jewish population of the region at the time. And I'm going to read to you the testimony of just one, just one, there are many, there are many, just one of those Jews who survived. Aharon Shmuel Kenover, Kenover, who later on became the rabbi of Krakow in Poland and was a scholar and a writer and a teacher. This is how he described that horrible period. And I'm quoting... I lay alone with a broken leg, lame and crippled, when God destroyed the Polish and Lithuanian communities. Everything I valued was taken from me, my wealth and possessions, my family, my two little girls, murdered as martyrs, and all the holy books I had written. I thought I would be cut off from the land of the living, for I was defiled and filthy, rolling in the blood of the martyrs on the street who had given up their souls to die. I was starving, so thirsty that my tongue stuck to my palate. The enemy brought me to be killed many times. I stretched out my neck like a lamb to the slaughter. But God, in God's great mercy, has kept me alive until this day in the land of the survivors. That was written a decade after those decrees, 1659. And what happened to the people that survived? Most of them, most of them became refugees, and a large percentage of those were sold into slavery. The Muslim Tartans came, and they took the Jews and they sold them as slaves throughout the Middle East, particularly to Istanbul, which was the center of the slave trade at the time, the capital of it. Imagine Ukrainian Jews and the frozen tundra of the Ukraine being sold into slavery into Istanbul in the Middle East, sold as slaves. And what happened as a result was that the entire Jewish world raised money for Pidyon Shavuim. Remember that term, Pidyon Shavuim, the redeeming of the captives. I'm going to come back to that. We have stories of people who wrote books so that they could make money, so that they could redeem their children and their spouses who were being sold into slavery. This period was called Korban Ukraine. Now, the term korban before this time was used only once for only one event in Jewish history. Do you know what that event was? The destruction of the temple, korban habayit, which meant, which meant that the catastrophe, which was the greatest catastrophe in Europe, his, European history until the Shoah for the Jews, was thought of at that time as equivalent to the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And still, at the beginning of the 20th century, before the Shoah, between 1918 and 1921, just in those few years, there were over a thousand anti-Jewish riots and military actions, which we commonly refer to as pogroms, throughout that area, which we now call Ukraine. And it was those pogroms that convinced my great-grandfather Pinchas, Alava Shalom, and probably your great-grandparents, many of them, to leave and never look back. And we know what happened 
to those that didn't leave. Of that, I'm only going to say this. Once World War II started, different nations had different levels of collaboration with the Nazis. And without going into too much detail, I will only say that Ukraine was maybe the most brutal to the Jews in its midst. And I tell you all of this in part because while this war is not about Jews and not about anti-Semitism, the truth is, is that the story of the Ukraine is a part of Jewish history. It is in part, it is a Jewish story. The suffering and the destruction in that region has touched many different people and many different ethnic groups for hundreds of years, that is for sure. But it has touched our people, the Jewish people, every single time over those 400 years in a disproportionate way. Now during and particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union, many Jews left Ukraine. I remember as a teen standing on the corner of Green Street in San Francisco outside the Soviet consulate with my AZA chapter chanting one, two, three, four, open up the iron door, five, six, seven, eight, let our people immigrate. I remember wristbands with Natan Sharansky's name on it. This week, I called every family that we could identify in our shul who had immigrated from Ukraine. Only one still had family in that country. And we received word on Thursday night that, thank God, their family are now safe after a harrowing, days-long journey to cross the border into Moldova. Moldova. But some stayed, a lot, 100, 200,000 Jews, according to some estimates, making Ukraine one of the largest Jewish communities in the world today. And now, once again, those Jews and the 39,800,000 other citizens of the Ukraine are once again in grave danger. And so I want to say three things. One. It is okay to have complicated feelings about Ukraine because of its history of anti-Semitism. This was painfully highlighted on Tuesday when a Russian strike hit the area of Babi Yar, the Holocaust Memorial Center, where tens of thousands of Jews were killed during Nazi occupation of Kyiv, Ukraine's capital. And which on my text is written in bold and underlined in all capital letters. And right now, it doesn't matter. Because Russia is an aggressor that is killing innocent men and women and children. We can acknowledge our complicated feelings about what happened in the past, but right now, we have to do what is right. Two, our history has taught us time and time again that sometimes, not always, but sometimes out of calamity and catastrophe, our greatest moral accomplishments as a people, as human beings, can be achieved. That is true of the free world, and it is particularly true of Jewish history. There is no certainty in this, and the suffering can be long, it can be unimaginably horrific, Redemption does not always come in our lifetime or even in a generation. But thus far, for more than 3,500 years as a Jewish people, and through the steady march of liberty and democracy, which is not always a straight line, often, in the hands of good people, rising up in the face of tyranny, redemption has come. This conflict is uniting the free world. Now, I have seen and you have seen the destruction and rancor that we are capable of when we are divided and distrustful. We have been going through years of that. And so I am ready to see once again what good people, united in a righteous and noble cause, will be able to achieve. And three, Pidyon Shavuim, redeeming the captives. I said I was going to come back to that. We must do everything, everything within our power and resources to save those who are in grave danger. And here in this room, at this moment, I speak specifically of those amongst the 200,000 Jews of Ukraine 
the aged, the vulnerable, the children that are running for their very lives. We must save them. So this coming week, as I mentioned, Jaius, the Jewish Immigrant Aid Society and Jewish Federation, have convened a meeting to discuss how many Jewish refugees the Vancouver Jewish community can take. And where Canada once said none is too many, I intend to tell them that we will take every last one. And I do this with full confidence in you, in this congregation and in every congregation in this city, that we will back that up with that same sense of shlichut, of sacred purpose, that our parents and our grandparents and the Jews of 1649 dedicated to redeeming our ancestors. And as we will read next week on Purim, in the book of Esther, another Jewish hero who embraced her Jewishness at a moment of grave peril for her people, umi yodea im le'at kizot hagia l'machut. Maybe it is for a moment like this that you came to be part of the royal family. Maybe it is for a moment like this that we became a congregation. May God watch over all who are in harm's way. And may this war end peacefully and soon. Shabbat Shalom.